Um, yeah, before we even get started, I'm actually going to have you stand up again. <laughs> Sorry, we're going to exercise a little bit. Um, I want you guys, I just feel like this is, I feel like the Lord has a couple things for us just before we begin everything. One, that we cannot do anything without his spirit, anything that has to do with um, anything, anything productive. Um, and I don't want you to hear anything I say tonight. I want you to hear from the spirit and what the word of God is telling your own soul. And I was just, I've been praying for this and been praying for you. And I feel like there's just hearts in here that are just, have been hardened, whether it's by choice or whether it's by um, trial and it just needs to be watered, and it just needs to be softened by the Lord's Spirit. Um, I don't know if that's you, but I've just been praying for that, that the Holy Spirit would do a work in all of us that we wouldn't be able to explain ourselves, that it would just be from the Lord. So I have you stand on purpose, and I want you guys, this is where we get close. It's all right. We're all ladies, and we're at a retreat. You're all going to be laughing with each other later, and if you're like, I'm socially awkward or like super introvert, well, we're going to work on that. <laughs> so I just want you guys, if you can, to just put hands on each other's shoulders. And let's just pray. I want you to just pray in your heart. But pray with me while I pray that whoever's shoulders you're touching or hands you're touching, that you would be praying for that person. I don't necessarily want you to focus on yourself at the moment. I want you to focus on someone you are touching physically and pray for blessing over them. Pray for the Lord to give them a word this weekend, a word that they actually need to hear from the Lord. Um, and I'm going to be quiet. We're going to practice being quiet for just like, don't worry, be like 15 seconds, 20 seconds. But I want you to just really take time to pray for the person you are touching. Um, so let's just do that right now. Ask for the Lord to come and give them a word. Yes, Lord, I just, I pray for all of us in here. Um, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us this far, bringing us here and bringing us together. And Lord, I thank you so much that um, you tell us when we gather in your name that you're going to come. You tell us when we seek you with our whole heart that you will be found. And I pray, Lord, for women in here who feel like maybe this is their last straw. Like, I'm going to come here, but I don't know if you're real. I don't know if you can really speak to the, the thing so deep in my soul that, that needs spoken to. But God, you can, and I pray that you will. I pray that you would soften souls in here, Lord. Replenish us. Renourish us, Lord. Um, just make our soil plantable, Lord, again. Um, yeah, just fall afresh on this place, on us, on our lives, and bless each and every one of these women, Lord, here this whole weekend. May we leave changed by your spirit, Lord, than when we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Okay, now you can be seated. <laughs> Um, I have to say, while we were worshiping, it was so awesome. Who's the little baby? His, his name's Toby? Is his real name Toby? Okay. I thought I heard that from someone, but I wasn't sure. So my son's name is Tobias. And I don't know, you probably know this already. Why did you name him Tobias? Do you know why you named him Tobias? Or are you just like, that's rad? <laughs> what does it mean? It's okay. It means God is good. Well, one of the definitions we looked up, which is why we named our son Tobias, means God is good. And I was loving it while you guys were worshiping and everyone was just hands held high and singing to the Lord. He was laughing and clapping. And I actually was like, oh my gosh, his name is Tobias because I heard it from someone. But I'm like, his name is Tobias, meaning God is good. And like, God is even inhabiting the praises of that little baby. Well, sometimes we think, oh, we can just praise, or we have to just stand so serious, and we just look dead while we're worshiping an alive God. And that's horrible. That's a horrible picture of God, just sitting there like, oh, here we are. And like, here's this little baby just like, I see everyone in here, and he's so excited. And I'm like, man, that's just God in that little soul. Um, I love it. And by the way, mama of the baby, don't ever feel bad if he makes noises because um, God loves children, and we, we welcome children all the time. Um, 
Okay, if you can open your Bibles to John 15. While you're doing that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, even though this, has, this retreat has nothing to do with me, everything to do with Jesus. But um, my name is Megan. My husband and I um, pastor a church out in Spokane, Washington. We planted a church uh, six years ago in January, um, and we're still alive. <laughs> so praise the Lord for that. Um, I have three kids. I have a son who's uh, 13, a daughter who's four, and another daughter who just turned three this month. So I'm a busy mom, a tired mom, um, but I love my life because God is so good. But that's my mama over there, and I feel like, as Sarah said, gosh, (laughs) Sarah said, and Sarah's my sister, Corinne's my niece, but Sarah said how cool it is to serve with my daughter. Um, I think how cool it is to serve with our mama. Um, our mama was um, handpicked by Jesus out of a family who doesn't love Jesus nor wants to know Jesus. And um, my mom passed down the legacy to us, and we're get to pass it down to our kids. So I'm pretty blessed and encouraged by that. Okay. Oh, fun fact. Kim, your pastor's wife, actually came and taught a women's retreat for my mom's church. And I think it had to have been, I don't even know if you remember this, nine or ten years ago. Yeah, it had to have been like 10 years ago. And I remember one thing, I mean, everything is probably super awesome, so don't take it that way. But I remember she came up and she had a basket. And I wanted to do this so bad, but I had, my flight here was nuts and I had no time. But she had a basket and and I actually think the theme was John 15, which is super interesting. And she had a basket, and she put blankets in it, and candles in it, and like a Bible in it, and a journal in it, and a book. I don't remember. There was probably chocolate in it. And she, on her own, had bought everything for the basket and brought it to our retreat and said, I just feel like God wants to speak to someone to remind them that they need to abide in Jesus and rest in Jesus. And this is a quiet time basket that you can have. And I'll never forget that visual picture. Oh, I wanted to do it so bad. So sorry. I don't have a gift to give you tonight. But... Uh, my flight here was crazy. Um, I, I left Spokane yesterday at noon, and my flight was delayed four hours because they were having crazy tornado storms in Denver. So they didn't allow any flights to fly in for a few hours. So by the time I got there, my second flight into Montrose was canceled. So I had to get a hotel, and like, it was okay. But I'm, I'm, I don't like to be by myself. <laughs> I never have liked to be by myself, and so I was like freaking out my own mind being by myself and I was like do I put the chair in front of the doorknob like they do on movies just to make sure no one breaks in you know and so um but I I finally fell asleep I kept praying for peace like let me sleep let me sleep I wasn't supposed to be by myself tonight and then at 2 30 in the morning I just hear the wind howling outside like so loud and I'm stressing out and like my mind's very dramatic so I'm like oh man, I'm going to die. And I'm in my pajamas. And I'm like, I missed it. I missed the tornado warning call. And I'm the last one in the hotel. So I get up and I open my window and I'm checking the parking lot to see if anybody's running out in their pajamas. And I missed it. I didn't see anybody. So I went back to bed. Anyway, long story short, finally got to Montrose and then we drove five hours to get here. So it's been a long journey. But with that being said, I know that all of you have your own stories of how you got here, right? Some are here from being invited by someone else. Some are here like, I don't know, I just came for the food. (laughs) I came for a rest. Whatever the reason is, um, just I really truly believe that your pastor's wife and leaders and us, we've been praying for you to be here, and it's not on accident that you're here. Um, So the theme is to abide, and we're going to talk about what that means. Um, I love this this word. Uh, The definition of abide in the Hebrew means to settle down or dwell. In the Greek, it means to stay or remain. In English, it means to bear patiently or to endure without yielding, to wait. And in Aramaic, this is actually my favorite one, it's the word kiwa. I think that's how you pronounce it. It means not only to remain, but to remain until the end or conclusion of something. And Jesus tells us 10 times in John 15, 1 through 11, to abide. So do you think it's important that we remember? He tells us 10 times in 11 verses 
this word over and over again. To settle down, to dwell, to stay or remain, to bear patiently, to endure without yielding, to wait, and to remain until the end or conclusion of something. Now, I'm going to say these definitions again back to you, and I want you to do a soul test check on yourself and see, in, see if you're killing it in any of these areas, okay? So, when I read these back to you, in your own heart, raise your hand if you're like, oh, yeah, I got this down. To settle down, to dwell, to stay, to remain, to bear patiently, to endure without yielding, to wait to remain to the end or conclusion. How'd you do? Oh, nice. Way to be honest. Did anybody, you're like, I'm killing it. You're like, this is me. This is me, right? You're like, I can settle down. I can stay. I'm doing great. I, I can stay in one place with full contentment. Not me, ever. But I want to encourage you, all of you came with something here. All of you came with something hard on your heart, something in your mind, something that you're even thinking, oh, man, I got I to gotta make sure the house is clean for Mother's Day because I have people coming over. Or you have so much on your mind. But I just want to encourage you, as Kim already said and Sarah said it in one of the songs, like just lay it at the Lord's feet and come and settle your hearts down and your minds down. Because in the quiet place is where we truly meet Jesus and find Jesus and get the power of the Holy Spirit to do the things that you are called to do in this life. The world we live in is so loud, is it not? It's so hard for us to settle down and to stay still. In America especially, it's go, 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 go. You know, I actually um, was thinking while we were worshiping, I just got back this week, Monday, Sunday, Monday, I was at a pastor's conference in Portland. And it was so cool to see um, hundreds of pastors and their wives worshiping together. And then to come here and see us worshiping together. And God is just as inhabited in the praises of you as it is in 500 pastors and their wives. But then I started thinking of the little, little groups in China that can meet underground. Right? We think, oh, it's so hard in America. There's so much politics and this. Like, we have no idea what hard means. We have no idea what it means in the cultures that are uh, in Afghanistan, right? When they're being um, incredibly tortured for worshiping the Lord in public, and they have to gather in these um, small places. But that's what I was thinking. That had nothing to do. That was a rap trail. So in America, right, it's always go, go, go for us. We're always looking, and we have the freedom to do that. That's what I was thinking. In these other cultures, they don't have the freedom to do these things. But in America, it's loud. We're always pursuing for the next thing, right? I'm actually laughing because I've heard a few go, wait, we don't have Wi-Fi up here? We don't have reception up here? How are we going to live? And I'm, I'm laughing because I'm like, man, what a, this is so funny because I was like, I've been studying this for a while and I think it's on purpose that there's no reception up here. I really do. And I want you to trust in that fact. Trust in Jesus for that fact, that there is no reception on purpose because it's in the quiet and the stillness where we actually meet the presence of God, right? Oh man, we were reminded of that story at this pastor's conference where Elijah comes out and he's like, how are you going to talk to me? And the Lord's like, go to the mountain. And he passes by, right? And he passes by in, I forget which one was first, the whirlwind, but it says God was not in the whirlwind. God was not in the fire. God was not in the earthquake. Although Elijah saw all of that, it said he was in the still, small voice, right? That gentle whisper, the breath, that gentle breath and whisper is when Elijah got to hear him speak to him and give him words to sustain him for the next thing God was calling him to do. So just remember that this weekend, right? Okay, there's no reception. I can't look on Facebook. I can't look on social media. I genuinely believe it's on purpose for your full focus to be on the Lord and what he has for you. The world we live in is so loud. Lots of unnecessary, unnecessary anxiety and pressure on our souls. Does anybody else feel pressure? Raise your hand. Yes. Very good. And those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're lying. I'm just kidding. Right? pressure, anxiety, so much. But guess what? It was never supposed to be like this. And if that's hard to believe, I, I found this so fascinating. Just read the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. 
If you've never read the Bible and you're like, what was it supposed to be like with just us in the presence of the Lord, with the loudness around us not there, the chaos not around, read the first two chapters. It is like drinking a cup of cold water on a hot day. Because all you read is God saying, oh, there was nothing. It was quiet. It was stillness. And then he speaks everything into existence. And then on the sixth day, he creates man mankind, man and woman. And then he tells them, enjoy this garden. Enjoy this time where I can walk with you in the garden. You're with me. My presence is with you. You're with me. And everything's fine. Have any of you ever been to the Creation Institute in Kentucky? Yes. A couple of us. Um, My favorite part was walking in and seeing the garden because you see Adam and Eve naked in... You don't really... You know what I mean. You... (laughs) you see them naked in like this pond and like there's like lilies like floating around them in like real water that like it looks like Disneyland if you've ever been to Disneyland they created it so well it's like it looks like it's real and then you hear all you hear is birds chirping through the speakers and you just hear waterfalls flowing and you hear wind you just feel these subtle things and there's Adam and Eve just enjoying the garden And I think about, I loved it. Me and my husband were like, this was our favorite part. And I think, you know, for him, he's like, I just, yeah. (laughs) Won't record that. (laughs) But we were like, oh, to just be together where there's no pressure. There's nothing else out there. Like, we can just be in here and enjoy the presence of God. And it said the presence of God walked with them, right, in the garden. And then what happened in Genesis chapter 3, it only took two chapters (laughs) This is a fat book. I mean, if you hold up your Bible, there's lots of words in here. It only took two chapters, and the third chapter, we messed it all up. Because we listened to the voice of the enemy say, you don't need God. Right? He said, hath God really said, Eve? Right? It's like, you don't really need that voice. You don't need that one telling you what you should do and where you should go and how you should do it. You don't need it. You can do it yourself. And how, if you believe in spiritual warfare, you, it doesn't take a genius to open your eyes and look around and see how the enemy has lulled us to sleep. You don't need God. You don't need to be in his presence for power right? Look at your phone. Everything he is, is causing us to not get into that secret place with Jesus to get his power. Do you know that Jesus himself had to withdraw himself often to pray? Luke 5, 16 says he withdrew himself often to pray. Why? He was Jesus. Why did he need to? Because he also took the form of human flesh and he knew what it was like to need to be empowered by the Father to do the work of the ministry, to love people. Kim brought up Mary washing Jesus' feet. That is exactly the week, right, of where John 15 takes place. Oh my gosh, we haven't even read it. Oh, forgive me, God. We're going to read it right now. Introduction. Um, she washed his feet and then he goes on to tell them, guys, wash wash one another's feet, love one another. And then he says, but you can't do these things without my power, without me. So let's go ahead and read it. John 15, starting in verse one. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it'll be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. 
So why is the idea of abiding so important? I think it's because he knows we need to come away. We need to come away from the volume of the world and just rest. He knows that we cannot live to our fullest potential to be the wives we're called to be, the mamas we're called to be, the women we're called to be apart from him. Remember, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. I felt like as I was studying this, the word counterfeit came to my mind, right? He's like, apart from me, you can't bear fruit. And you're like, you might be thinking in your mind, no, I'm bearing fruit. Like, I'm serving. I go to my church every week. I'm serving in the children's ministry. Or I clean up after. Or I'm on the worship team. I'm leading youth group. I'm leading children's ministry. I'm teaching whatever your thing is. I'm doing these good. I'm serving the homeless. I'm doing this. But is it real fruit? Or is it counterfeit? I started thinking about that. Like, the enemy's pretty good at the counterfeit, right? The fake. Um, when when uh, FBI people, I think that's who they are, when they study money, they study the real thing so that they know how to spot the counterfeit, right? And I think when we are not abiding in God's word, when we are not abiding in his presence, it might be hard for you to spot the counterfeit fruit that's coming out of your life, right? Oh, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing. But what did God tell Mary and Martha in Luke? He said, Mary, or he said, Martha, you're missing the one thing that matters to me, the one thing that's important. And Mary's chosen the good thing because you're serving Martha and Mary's sitting. And Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. Was Martha doing anything bad? No. Martha was serving Jesus. If Jesus was in here, would someone go grab him a cookie? Right? Would you say, I made these, actually. <laughs> Try mine. Right? Would someone, like, stand up and be like, oh, my gosh, please, Jesus, take my seat. What can we do? Someone go get him water. You know, someone get him a piece of gum. Like, whatever he needs, someone give him that. And he's like, hold on. Like, Mary, Martha was doing the same thing, right? But, man, when Jesus came into their home, Mary just went. And wherever he was, Mary was. And Mary sat there, and she soaked it in. And he, tells, he told Martha, this, Martha, is what matters, this is the only thing that matters. You got, I feel like God has been trying to get this to sink inside my heart so much where he's like, Megan, I'm going to keep bringing it back over and over and over again until you figure it out, till you actually do it. How many times are we told to do things and we know to do them, but do you actually do it? The things the word of God says, right? He says, be doers of the word, not just hearers only. But I know he's created rest on purpose because he knows we need it. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, one of my favorite passages. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus gives us rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When what? When we listen to a podcast? When we, I mean, think about all the things that you could think about right now when you think of rest. And he says, no, no, it's me, right? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I thought this was so good. I read this somewhere and I'm going to read it to you. It's not my words. Oh, I think it was out of David Gusick's commentary. He says, I wrote it in pink and like really little. So give me, <laughs> give me a second. He wants you to know that he is gentle, not harsh, not reactionary, um, he's not easily exasperated. He is, most, he is the most understanding person in the universe. The posture most natural to him, I love this, the posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. How many of you sometimes you think, man, God's just angry at me. God's just mad at me. He hasn't, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I said to my husband before we got here. You don't know how I yelled at my kids before I left. You don't know this or this. That's not God. God's not doing this. He does this. He says, I just want you to bring all that. Bring all that to me and let me hear it. Let me hear it from you. It says, the point in saying that Jesus is lowly is that he is accessible. No one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus. Isn't that so beautiful? No one. Think about, if you read the Gospels, he was so approachable, right? 
even though his disciples were like, no, no, he doesn't have time for you. He doesn't have this. Jesus was like, no, you let them come to me. And he's like, even when he was tired, he blessed people, put his hands on people, fed people, delivered people, healed people. You are his people. The one creation that was created that means the most to him is not waterfalls. It's not the beach, right? It's not the most beautiful thing you can think of. It's you. When you look in the mirror, you are what's most important to him. You are the only one that reflects his image. Man, lately I've been thinking of the word creativity. God is so creative. Just look around with your eyes. Not one of you is the same as the other one, and yet billions of babies keep being born with different DNA, different chromosome makeup. I'm not a doctor, so forgive me for my horrible butchered words, right? Like everyone is different and yet he keeps creating. He keeps doing it. I'm like, wow, my mind is like blown how he keeps creating, but he loves you. You were created in his image, not trees, not waterfalls, not the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. You were, you matter to him and All he wants is for you to come to him. He wants to be your father. He wants to be your best friend. He wants to be your healer and your deliverer and everything you need. In the Old Testament, he says, I am who I am. And he doesn't finish it. I love that. He doesn't finish that sentence. Why? Because he wants to be everything you need at this moment. Fill in the blank for yourself. I need this. There he is. I need peace. He is your peace. I need love. He is your love of your life. I need satisfaction. I need contentment. I need fulfillment. I need healing. That's who he is. And he created you to know him that way. I love the fact that God created rest. He invented the idea. (laughs) Aren't you thankful for that? He He just invented it, right? Six days it took him to create the world with humans and animals and everything else in it. And then on the seventh day, what did he do? He rested. And as I was studying this, I loved this. He rested on the seventh day, but what did he keep saying after everything he created? What did he say? It's good. And then he rested in the goodness of what he created. And I truly believe that it was a day to look around in wonder at what he created. And this is what he wants us to do in rest, is to look around and remember the goodness of him in your life and the faithfulness of him in your life. I get that. Man, it's hard to rest. In the world we're living, we already said how loud it is, how noisy it is, how chaotic it is. Right? If you're a mom, you're being pulled in so many directions. If you work, you're being pulled by so many voices and opinions of what you need to do and get done. So how? How do we go rest? We're going to learn that more tomorrow. But I think there's a key to not just necessarily being in a quiet place, which there is a very important time and place for that. But how do we rest in the midst of chaos when we can't go to the quiet place? Right? Sometimes I'm in my bathroom and I'm like, kids, just let me poop in peace. Sorry, I know you're recording that. But I'm like, just can mom just have two minutes in the bathroom, you know, by myself? And sure enough, sometimes I'll try to sneak away and go in the bathroom, and then I little fingers come under. This is it. They're just, mom, 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 are you there? Mom, what are you doing? Mom, mom. And I'm like, <laughs> like, how do we do this, right? In the midst of this, how do you find the rest? And I think even when it's crazy, even if I'm just speaking to the moms, because that's where I'm at right now. Even when we're making 10 meals a day with 15 snacks on top of it, while you're back in the kitchen, washing the dishes, folding the sixth load of laundry that you've done that day, you can find rest in just folding a pair of socks and remembering his goodness. Man, what's good around me right now that my kids are healthy? What's good around me right now that I actually have a house to live in? What's good around me right now? That I actually have food in the cabinets when things are so expensive right now. That I actually have some gas in the gas tank, right? Or man, what's good? Man, just that last week, so-and-so said this, and God did this, and God brought this. That's resting. That's resting because you're not thinking about the chaos and the stuff that stresses you out anymore. You're just thinking simply and wholly about the goodness of God. And it brings this supernatural peace that you cannot explain to anyone. 
And sometimes people will see that and they'll say, what, how are you? How are you so calm during this? How are you so peaceful during this? Man, it's just simply knowing the goodness of God all around me. Yeah, life's not easy. I'm not saying it is. But if you remember his goodness, it'll help you to keep propelling you to go forward. Um, the lies of this world, the lies of the enemy are just so loud. And I'm going to name a few of them. And maybe you can relate to some of these. The lies of where our true satisfaction comes from. The lie, these are so loud. This is what I mean by lies. The voices around us, the loudness around us, what he calls us to come away from, what he calls us to come abide with him, leaving these things behind, right? The lie of alcohol, that it's our true satisfaction, the lie of drugs, the lie of sex, either without or within a marriage, right? So, oh, premarital sex or whatever you want to say, like that, people say that can satisfy, but even within a marriage, that's not fully satisfying. The lies of social media, right? Everybody knows that one. The lies of who we are supposed to be, what we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to look like, act like, dress like, be like, the lies of comparison, the distraction of Netflix, binge watching, Hulu, YouTube, TV, sorry, YouTube TV, TikTok, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, the lies of the more you have, the more respected you'll be, the lies of the more money, the happier, the happier you'll be right? There's so many more that you could probably think of in your head, and they're so loud, and they're thrown at us thousands and thousands and thousands of times per day. And this is why we're called to armor ourselves in Ephesians 6, to protect ourselves, right? To take up the spirit, or I'm sorry, take up the word of God and let it be our, our weapon, our prayer. Take our quiet time. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a few things. I have so much in my mind. Sometimes my mind goes really fast. I have a lot of energy, and I got to bring it back. Um, he calls us to protect our heart with the breastplate of righteousness, to hold up our shield of faith, to protect us from the fiery darts of all these lies around us, and to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Remember down here, he says, he talks about the Word, love his Word. And he says, Jesus will tell him, um, oh gosh, sorry guys, I lost, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, after listening to all these lies and listening to the crazy things that are so noisy and so loud around us doesn't it make you just want to go back to the garden <laughs> right doesn't it make you just want to close your eyes and take a deep breath and listen to waterfalls and listen to quiet sounds and just sit in the presence of God with no distraction around you and if you're like yes that's what I'm craving that's what I'm longing for you can you might not be able to go to the physical Garden of Eden, but you can. Jesus is found in the secret place. I just love so many times that he says, if you seek me, you will, I will, you will find me, right? You will be found by me. Come to me, all you who are weary. I'm the one that takes your burdens from you. Mark 6, 31 through 32, I already said this. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to even eat. Does that, does that resonate with anybody? And they went away in a boat by a desolate. By it, they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. If you're feeling pulled like this in many directions, so many things coming and going, listen to the call of Jesus and just come and abide and rest in Him for a while. Come settle down. Come stay. Come remain. Come wait. Right? Don't yield in to the enemy. That one says, continue without yielding. Endure without yielding. The enemy is so good at wanting us to give up. Have you ever tried sitting in silence? Is it easy or hard? Oh, it's so hard. You have to train yourself. You have to retrain your brain that you can sit in silence and be quiet and not have your phone by you and not have another voice by you. I'm actually going to encourage you to do that this weekend because I'm not just encouraging you. I am learning this spiritual discipline. I am learning it in my own life. My husband and I and our kids are learning to be quiet. So I actually teach children's ministry. I love it. It's my jam. Kids are. And we're starting to go through the spiritual disciplines with our kids in our church. And the first one was meditating and thinking and pondering on the things of God. 
And one thing they just tell you to do for kids, because we all know attention spans aren't there for so long, right? They say just like have your kids be quiet, maybe for even like 30 seconds. Tell them to close their eyes. Practice. They can practice being quiet. I, and trust me, I have a four-year-old who's like, you think I have a lot of energy? She's way beyond me. And I, I have to I'd be like, sit down. It's okay. Sit down. We're going to practice. We're going to practice. And we say, be quiet. Mommy's going to read a psalm. And I just will read Psalm 23 or I've read little psalms. And then I'll ask them. I'll say, and your, when your eyes are quiet, and then we'll give it like a couple seconds. And then I say, what do you think you heard from God when I read that scripture? And you don't doubt what they say, no matter what, because who are you to say something, right? You're not in their mind, unless it's totally heretical. You can re-guide them to where they, but it's been so awesome to watch my girls. The night before we came here, um, I had my husband play a worship song, and we all sat in the girls' room to tuck them into bed, and I had them be quiet and listen to daddy's song, and then we were quiet, and we said, okay, let's just be quiet, and I just want you to think of a word that maybe describes who Jesus is. And it was real quiet for a little bit. And then Jordan was like kind of embarrassed. She's my four-year-old. And she goes, love? And I said, love, very good. And then my little Evie, she's three. And she sat me up and she said, God helps us. God helps us. And my son said, father, father. Like they know. And that's where God wants us to be. Just sit and be quiet and say, what do you want to show me? What do you want to speak to me? This is where he wants us to come. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about where we abide and how we abide and why it's so important to do this abiding. And Saturday, when you guys, before you leave, my mom's going to teach on the outcome of abiding, joy, and I'm really excited for that one. But for tonight, we're done. I just think it's super important that we come, Sarah, actually, can you come up here? That and Corinne, we come to the feet of Jesus and we just prepare our hearts for what he wants to say. And my encouragement to you is sometime this weekend, practice just for 10 minutes. This is what I'm doing in my practice. I'm putting 10 minutes on my cell phone, a timer, and you can flip it over so you don't see the dings of Facebook or the dings of messages or whatever. And you just sit there. This is just, you can do whatever you want. But my practice is I'm sitting there and I'm raising my hands and I'm saying, okay, God, I'm here. What do you want to say? And what do you want to do today? Let me be in your will. And then it's, it's hard. But practice just not saying anything for 10 minutes and see what he says. And if there's a word that comes to you, write it down. If there's a verse that comes to you, Write it down. That's, that's God speaking to you in the quiet. This is where we find him. Um, I just feel like it's important we reread this again, but you can close your Bibles and listen. Actually, let's do that. You guys close your Bibles and just close your eyes. You could play like little music, but just listen as I read this portion of scripture again that we have for the retreat. And then Sarah's going to do a song, but just for like a little bit after I read it, just for like 30 seconds. I just want you guys again to be quiet before the Lord. Sit there before the Lord and ask him, what is it do you want me to know tonight and for the weekend? I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. I'm going to read that verse again. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full.